Welcome, friends, to the podcast, Speaking of Faith. I am delighted to be joined today by Bishop Douglas Lucia. He is hails from upstate New York. Uh, having grown up in the Plattsburgh area, he is approaching his 35th anniversary of ordination to the priesthood. He has been Bishop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Syracuse since 2019, and in that role, as with all of his roles before that, he has served with integrity and an eye on healing and restorative justice for those who have been hurt by systems and people. And I'm joined by Bishop Lee Miller II, also who also grew up in upstate New York and is actually the second Bishop Lee Miller for the upstate New York Synod of the ELCA. His father was Bishop during the 90s. In his ministry, Bishop Miller has a clear and joyful focus on partnerships and pastoral care. And I've experienced him to be someone whose ministry brings healing, compassion, and unity in Christ to a variety of spaces too. This summer will mark three years of Bishop Miller's Episcopate, and it has been a joy to have him as a colleague as well as Bishop Lucia. My name is Dee Dee Duncan Proby. I am the Episcopal Bishop of Central New York. For me, that is from Canada to Pennsylvania, Utica to Elmira, and all the beautiful people and places in between. And our topic today is refuting the doctrine of discovery. And if you have not read or heard about the doctrine of discovery, that is something we're going to talk about uh, today. And so, um, Bishop Lucia, I would love for you to begin the conversation about what has led us to want to engage in this work together. Well, what has led us really to engage in this work together is about when I became Bishop of Syracuse, all of a sudden, of the Catholic Diocese, all of a sudden I began to hear about a working group sort of out of Lemoyne, but discussing this whole doctrine of discovery. Um, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, for folks, doctrine of discovery goes back to the um, 16th century when in the age of exploration, and um, it comes actually from the the Catholic Church in the sense is what they call papal bulls, papal documents that were um, used to give the rulers of the day sort of carte blanche that when they entered, quote unquote, a pagan territory, they basically could take land or whatever they wanted. And so the doctrine of discovery then um, what has what we're doing uh, or what we're discussing these days is how do we I mean, they it has technically been uh, repealed, but it still exists. And, and for us here in central New York, just to give you an example, when the United Indians settled uh, were were um, discussing land claims back, I believe it's like 90s or early 2000s. They, again, um, some of the court decisions cited from the U.S. Supreme Court um, had its basis in the doctrine of discovery. So right. for us today, it's really trying to, um, to as uh, Bishop Didi already said, it's, it's all about how do we um, make reparation, but more than the word reparation, how, how do we um, correct what has happened here? And and so that's how I got into it, so to speak. All of a sudden, I, I was learning about it. And um, so um, that's my background. And then I, I wanted two compatriots to be with me. So <laughs> I, I sort of roped Bishop Didi and Bishop Miller into <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. we were glad about. We we yeah. enjoyed that. But uh, uh, Bishop Miller, uh, I'm taking over Rachel's role here in a minute. She's going to be the facilitator. But I'm just going to go ahead and jump in here, Rachel. Um, you Bishop do Miller, you do you, Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, t uh, I think tell our listeners a little bit about your what brings you to this conversation as well. Yeah, thanks so much. What a gift it is to be together and to be the church together and to be able to share in this work and, and ministry. Um, I uh, am an upstate New York um, a child person um, born in, in Jamestown. I was a young child in Buffalo and then adolescence and high school in Syracuse and my undergrad work uh, at SUNY Albany. And so growing up as a, uh, as a throughway baby, 
uh, was familiar certainly with the with the land around upstate New York and the ways that we are how we differentiate ourselves from those from New York City and the, when people outside of New York here in New York they only think of the city they don't think of the beautiful land that is across so much of of our state um, and around that time living in Syracuse one of the places where they would take us in third grade uh, was a place along Onondaga Lake called the French Fort. And the French fort was, uh, uh, as you pulled up to it, it was, it was what a um, um, a young child might think of when they when they think of those colonial times in terms of a, a barrier wall that that the uh, uh, colonial villages would would live within or behind. And what we were told is that over the the pointed walls and the the pointed sticks of the French fort, uh, that is how the French colonialists. Uh, defended themselves from from the Mohawk peoples and others of of those who were called the Iroquois peoples at the time. Twenty years later, as a young adult, and my father was was retired, uh, he said I began volunteering. He said I'm I'm volunteering at this place that's called Saint Marie among the Iroquois. And as it turns out, it was the same place that had been called the French Fort when I was a child. But they said, actually, we got the story wrong. It, it was never a place where the French colonialists had been, been fighting with the indigenous folks, but rather it was a place where the French colonialists and, the, uh, and members of the Mohawk uh, peoples were living together in harmony until each of their communities told them that that they were a threat to the other, and if they did not abandon uh, being in community together, then their respective uh, national parties would come and and um, and 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 destroy everyone. Well, it turns out that wasn't fully the truth either. Um, and what I have learned by being in community and relationship with Bishop Lucia and Bishop Duncan Proby is uh, is that we have begun to. Um, hear more from the Onondaga nation and her people of the truth of the Onondaga people who see Onondaga Lake as the source and place of creation, as the source of Turtle Island where all life came from, and share stories about how life came birthing up among this place. And in that truth, of course, we hear as uh, Caucasian European descent folks of the, uh, the impact of colonialization, the impact of genocide uh, in this in this land, um, and and I've had to to relearn a history that I was told that that at best was not the whole truth, and at its worst was really absolute lies. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up believing that the reason why there weren't more uh, indigenous persons, more Haudenosaunee, is that there. Their population must have just been so much fewer uh, than people of European descent and white folks. And, and I did not know the truth in third grade about General Washington sending armies up what we would now call I-81 uh, and into the valley and um, be giving permission to generals to commit genocide along the way in the place that we would now call upstate New York. So for the, for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, we have been, we have initiated a campaign called the Truth and, and, and Healing Campaign, uh, where mm -hmm. we might tell these truths. And I, I know Bishop Didi that you as well have been telling truths of the boarding schools, and maybe we'll we'll continue to go into those issues. But so, what I think I want to say is that I've learned from my childhood where I was not, where we did not always teach one another the truth, um, and the truth mm -hmm. about racism, the truth about. Uh, genocide and, and white white supremacy worldview and and how that impacted uh, the communities and and the people from whom we serve now. Thank you. Well, you know oh, what brought I'm, me to this really. I'm sorry. Uh, may I, may I uh, Bishop? I, I I'm sorry that I didn't bring that to the to the contemporary um, uh, location now on Onondaga oh, Lake. It's no am. longer Saint Marie among the Iroquois, but is the Scanone uh, Center for the great law of peace and that right. it is operated and managed by the, by the Onondaga nation. That's right. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm the outlier. I did not grow up here. Um, I grew up uh, in Fort Worth, Texas, where we talked about uh, different things and, but all under the same guise of that the sort of manifest destiny issues and, and this is just what it was. And, and, and like Bishop Miller, 
you know, oh, well, this is because those people just died out or because this was, it was not because someone intentionally uh, was harming people. And so I became bishop in 2016. And at that time began to uh, learn about the history of our diocese uh, here and about this local area. And I had the opportunity to um, gather with some of the Haudenosaunee um, at the farm that uh, the here in Onondaga, uh, and in listening to their stories, I realized a lot more. I had, of course, learned a lot over my lifetime about indigenous issues in other places, but I began to learn about those issues here. And when I went to my staff and, and said, you know, have you heard about uh, whether it's Sullivan's campaign or some of the other things, and people who had grown up here had no idea what I was talking about. And I was really stunned because um, I felt like I was late to the party. Like I was just didn't know. And, um, and then the doctrine of discovery was something that when I learned about it in seminary, um, what I learned about was the papal bull aspect of it, what it meant for the church and how it impacted, uh, you know, exploration around the globe. But what was not taught, was a devastating uh, impact on indigenous persons around the globe. And so I began, I think, in seminary more earnestly to learn about the doctrine of discovery and about indigenous issues. But then when I came here as bishop and realized this vacuum of knowledge, and then, of course, as both of the bishops have said, I've got to know them, and we began talking about this together uh, as people of faith. And it became more important I think to me and to one another to begin to really uh, talk about the evils of what happens when the dignity of others is not honored uh, with, you know, racism with, um, and with all of these different ways, how it impacts our world. And so this has been a real uh, journey of discovery for me about learning more about the boarding schools, as you mentioned, uh, Bishop Miller, and about how all of us can be part of lamenting what has been. And there is no way to re to make reparations for it fully. The damage is too extensive and horrific. But even today, the doctrine of discovery is used in our court system, as you noted, Bishop Lucia, to be the reason for um, you know further objectifying or um, be, uh, serving injustice. So um, it's something that I'm very committed to at this point in my life. And and my diocese um, has had not had a, a, a they've not been on the right side of the, the table, as it were, the right side of the issue. Um, the diocese has benefited from taking lands that were not legally uh, seated. The diocese has benefited from oppression of others. And so I feel particularly that it's our work to do to repent of that and to change that uh, now and into the future. So, so Rachel, now I will turn this over to you. <laughs> I mean, this is a problem. You give three bishops a microphone and, you know, it's a yeah. problem. Danger. <laughs> You'll never get a Listen, word. Listen, we have, we have thoroughly established on this podcast that I am a nerd. So I'm just sitting here listening and learning. <laughs> um, I really appreciate the way you all have kind of woven in your personal journeys um, with learning and unlearning um, about the doctrine of discovery and, and, and what you've said about how it continues um, in just even in recent memory to have legal ramifications um, in, in our area. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the theological and spiritual impact um, of this doctrine, which has been, as you noted, Bishop Lucia repealed, um, but we know has a lasting impact. Um, from your perspective, how is that impacting the spiritual uh, flavor, uh, the spiritual history of, of your faith tradition? Yeah. Well, you know, the problem is with the repealing, and, and I've said this in other venues, um, the problem with the repealing is on paper, it's repealed, but it doesn't mean it's repealed in our hearts, if I can use it that way, or in, in our behaviors. And and so for me, theologically, it really is a return to the prophets, where we're, we're called to rend our hearts 
and not just our garments and to really do something to uh, to do something um, to help heal a, a very um, grievous wound. You know, we, we sometimes talk about scars on Mother Earth or or, or the deep wounds that um, creation feels. And to me, I feel this is a deep wound. Uh, and um, and be, in that woundedness, though, um, I, I think of one of my favorite um, Christian writers, Henri Nouwen, who wrote a book called Wounded Healer. And I, and I think for me, that's really what we're looking at is how can we help the healing process. And, and in my own conversations with the Hadashani in particular, we have talked about that it's not really a question of reparation, um, but more like how can we move on from here? And, and one, of the, one of the key facets of that is a wampum, which for them is a treaty. We would probably look at it and think it's a belt, and it is a belt, but it's really a treaty. And there's one of the treaties called the two row. And now the two rows was actually made with the Dutch, Dutch settlers. But it was basically a recognition that we're going to share this land and, and we're going to walk together and we're going to respect one another. But there again, um, it didn't last, at least. And, and I will say not, not necessarily. Um, more on the part of the settlers who began to say, oh, I want this, I want that. It, and it's like um, sort of like encringement, if we use that word. So so it's all a really, an idea, for me more and more, it's just the idea of how do we start to, um, how do we um, acknowledge the past, but then how do we walk together again? And to me, that's the big question. I, and and in meeting with Hadashani, not just the chiefs, but even with the clan mothers, that is one thing I've learned is that it's really how do we move on from here? And and I don't want to monopolize here, but that that's really what I'm seeing right now. Yeah, I I think for me, um, I, I've been I've been thinking lately about. Um, as he asks us around theology, about, um, you know, at least two, two, two tracks, and one is around uh, Imago Dei, right? The image of God and and who is God as as we see God and in, in all of God's people, and right. so we know that in the doctrine of discovery, there's not a view that all people are created in the image of God and created in the image of loving kindness um, mm -hmm. for for that whole that whole doctrine is based in otherizing um, the person that is encountered, right? Um, and and certainly we know today, and I, I so appreciate, I think I'm getting goosebumps actually as I talk about it, that our three denominations today can be here together in this podcast to say that we all believe that people are created in the image of God and that God's love is for all of God's people. Mm -hmm. and, and so we can talk about... Uh, both in the renunciation and lament, but also as Bishop Lucia points us towards the future in terms of how and why do we go forward. Part of that is because we can see others not for the need to convert uh, or to make like us, but because each human being is beloved by the creator of, of all life. And then I've been thinking a bit about um, uh, as I, as I had the opportunity last year to travel to the Holy Land for the first time and to consider theology of land as it relates to the indigenous people in, in Palestine and so now in the conflict um, that, that continues to rage there. And, and um, it, 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 I can't help but to be pointed back to the indigenous people of the United States and the theology of land, uh, that the land and the doctrine of discovery is somehow given by God to Europeans who have traveled the, the seas in order to be here to say, this is now your land because God gave it to you. Um, and, and that our indigenous siblings do not see the land as something to own, um, but is, uh, 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 is, a, is a partner in life and is a gift by creator. 
Um, and so changing the way and learning from our indigenous siblings of, of our view of the land. And yes, it is, it is land that, that the creator has blessed, that God has blessed. And that is true with all land. There is, there is not only one portion of land called holy. Uh, the whole world that God so loves is, is holy and, and all of God's people are, are holy, um, before we, before we meet them. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, and I think we also, um, one of the things we tend to do with social justice or uh, with honoring other people is we kind of make it uh, ancillary to the gospel as if there's the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is about yeah. you know, my salvation. And then there's that other stuff that's good to do because I've been saved and it's good, but it's not at the core of it. And what I have come to really believe and understand about the gospel of Jesus is it's actually at the core of the gospel. There's no separation there that what salvation really means in terms of our world and one another and our relationship, that loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and loving our neighbors ourselves is that, you know, all the, every, you know, all the law and the prophets depends on that. If we're unloving with our neighbor, as First John tells us, then how can we say we know God? And so if we can look at the doctrine of discovery and how it continues to harm our world, how it continues to objectify, subjugate, and divide our, our siblings, our brothers and sisters, then how can we say we have known Jesus? And so mm -hmm. it really gets at the heart, not, of, oh, it's all about me, but actually all of me is about us. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk lately about Ubuntu, this wonderful understanding of I am because you are, which comes out of, uh, you know, from the African continent and other indigenous places with different ways of expressing it, um, that who we are is communal. And so it is essential that we address those places where our communal living is actually harming other people, because if we don't do that, then anything else we may say about our love for God or our love for Jesus is is negated because it is it is false. And it's hard work loving our neighbors ourselves to understand that deep reciprocity that in loving we are loved and in loving that we become loved. And um, so I think that relationship, 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 which the bishops don't know this, but those who listen to this podcast know, I think I say that every podcast, but it really does for me come down to these deep relationships with one another, which is why it's so wonderful to have uh, my brother bishops here with me today talking about this and why in, in talking about these things when we've gone to other places it has been so deeply meaningful to me because we do, as you pointed out, Bishop Miller, represent these, these major parts of Christendom coming together and having a conversation and saying, the way that it has been is no longer the way we will be because we know Jesus, because we hear God calling us to this work. Mm -hmm. I so appreciate, appreciate the way you all have been able to connect the theological with the lived out. And I wonder if we could dig into that a little bit more. Um, the name of this podcast is Speaking of Faith. And as Bishop Didi has said um, several times, uh, we live we live in a time and in place and perhaps um, in, in cultures that speaking of politics and speaking of religion and speaking of money is taboo. And, and the result of that is that we can't do it anymore. We've lost the skills. Um, and so what we try to do here is try to, um, is to take faith and, and bring it into action steps. And I know that for me sitting here, listening, um, to you all, um, conversation I so appreciate. There's part of my heart that just feels very heavy because this is so broken and so hard. Um, and there, you know, I can't fix it. Um, Bishop was, Bishop has great faith in her staff, um, <laughs> but we can't fix everything. And yeah. so I wonder if some of our listeners are feeling like that, if you all could speak into what, what are some steps that people of faith can take into being part of this healing work that you talked about, Bishop Lucia and, and Bishop Miller, the, the idea of honoring the image of God in all God's creation? Um, if you all could speak into that, I think that would be so helpful for us. Yeah. I don't mind going first if you'd like me to. Um, 
you. This is um, this is a, our third formal conversation that we've had in this way, a, a, a public conversation. And in our second one, uh, we were engaging with and were part of a, a conference at Syracuse University. And one of the leaders of the Onondaga Nation, I'll, I'll paraphrase the way that I heard what he was saying. So this is not quoting him, but what I what I heard him essentially saying is, I don't trust you all. I've mm -hmm. I've heard these words before, um, and not just from us, but from those in our similar positions, calls, places of power, and for centuries, right in in uh, in the place that we call the United States as a part of Turtle Island, and certainly coming from indigenous nations. And and um, I drove home that day really meditating on on those words and and. Um, and so I, so my first re response in thinking towards your question is part of the role of faith. Is, and, and I want to say he was correct. I mean, he's got no reason to trust me right there. So I don't want to, this is, That's right. this is me processing my stuff. I really appreciate that he said that out loud uh, and to be able to hear that. And so one, one thought and one response is, is as people of faith and as a person of faith, um, perhaps if I wasn't a person of faith, you might say in the midst of, oh, but the, but the, um, I think Bishop Lucia said it might be too late for reparations, or, or I don't want to put words in your mouth, but reparations becomes really tough um, because can you really make up for what has happened? Can anything I say um, to what you said fix, right? Nothing I can say can fix what has been. But then as people of faith, can I say, okay, um, that I can be about a posture of lament, sit in it a bit. And because we are cre connected by the creator, what can I do going forward? And so in, in addition to speaking some of these truths and having the truth telling be part of what we do going forward, I, I've been wondering about, again, simple acts um, and enjoying in joining with the cries for indigenous people as um, as they lift up uh, violence against women, and in particular violence against Indigenous women who have gone missing uh, or who have been killed. So being present-day advocates for that, uh, in addition to investigating some of the work of the past. So how, how do we stand with our Indigenous siblings today and the issues that they are concerned about today in the way that the Doctrine of Discovery continues to impact land agreements today um, and be really at work proactively towards uh, those justice issues that Indigenous communities um, are facing in the here and now um, and, and not just stay in the past. Or if we were not people of faith, perhaps we would shy away and say, oh, it, if it doesn't if it doesn't bother me, I'll shrink away into my privilege. Um, but to say no in Christ, um, the gift of love calls us to keep walking together and moving forward. I really appreciate that because I, I, I actually was going to have lunch with one of my indigenous friends from the Haudenosaunee um, farm, and we had arranged to have lunch. And when we arrived at the venue, I was a little bit early, and I was looking around, and I had never put two and two together with this particular restaurant. I'd never seen it, but I looked up and there was a headdress, an Indian headdress was one of the main uh, features of this restaurant, which is owned by European folks and which is appropriating the symbology of a headdress, which is very sacred. And, um, and it just hit me that I am so blind to how much is um, inappropriately either tokenized, appropriated, or uh, the ways in which subjugation is kind of perpetuated, as if it's those people's issue or this, or these are images that we can just use without recognition of the sacredness of them. And um, you know, out on the throughway where they have the the teepees at certain times of the year and they've lit them up, well. Teepees were a Plains Indian thing. That is not a Haudenosaunee thing. And, but if they put longhouses out there, you know, people wouldn't readily recognize. And yet in the schools in this area, school children, you know, get their popsicle sticks out and they make longhouses 
And then that's kind of, you know, that's the education. You made a longhouse, so you know all about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think speaking faith and then speaking of faith in this regard is to begin to acknowledge these places where this isn't something from the past. Although I think as, you know, white people or European folks, we need to learn. Uh, I think we have to re-educate ourselves and open our eyes, but then also to see the ways in which we may be contributing to appropriation that we aren't even, we don't even know to look there because we've been so blinded by, uh, by this, this sin. And that has been something that I think for our listeners to begin to open our eyes and to look at um, when images are used or when things are talked about, how how we talk about some of the political issues, how we talk about water rights and the ways in which we're talking about possession and power rather than relationship and honoring Mother Earth, to to begin to educate ourselves, but then in the course of educating ourselves, to begin, as you say, Bishop Miller, to advocate for change. And then I think some of the simple ways are just to speak with one another. I mean, a lot of us don't talk to our family or our friends and say, hey, have you, do, you know, do you know some of these stories or could we read a book together and learn together and talk um, to build relationships with, of respect with the, with Haudenosaunee or indigenous persons from other places? Um, there's so much, I think, and to Rachel's point, it can feel so overwhelming, like, oh, I can't fix this, so I won't do anything. I don't know what to do because it's so big, so I'll just stop. And to have the courage to just uh, do one thing. Catherine Meeks is a beloved person in the Episcopal Church, and she said, just be a smidge braver, just a, just a smidge. And so learn one thing and talk about that thing. Uh, go to the Scano Center or learn about imagery. And then to just take one step um, and then take the next. Um, and like you said, the one gentleman that you're talking about who was at Syracuse University uh, talked about land acknowledgments. And he said, if you're going to acknowledge the land, then give it back. And it really struck me because um, that's something I have wrestled with uh, as people getting up and doing land acknowledgments, but with no uh, connection to any sort of activism or relationship or response. And so with my clergy, I actually told them, do not do a land acknowledgement mm -hmm. until you've written the acknowledgement with a relate out of relationship until you've done something about it because otherwise it's just um it's empty and it's like a clanging gong as first Corinthians would tell us so yeah. it's funny you were talking about land acknowledgement because that's what i was thinking that was one of the things i was thinking that was i i really that did strike me as well was this whole idea like we just and I think that was um, going back to what Bishop Miller was saying about that meeting. I think one of the things really was they were asking us, well, just don't talk to talk. If you're going to talk about it, do something. That's right. And and that to me is, is a very uh, practical thing. But I was also struck, and uh, I don't know if the other two bishops caught this. I think I might have shared it with you afterwards. But um, it was very interesting that one of the clan mothers who I've gotten to know and I, I, I consider a close friend in the sense of, of Frida Jacques and Frida turned to me and and because this whole thing about returning land and 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 she said to me you know she said I don't know about she said I understand this is a lot she says you know one thing right now we're looking for is we really could use um like a medical clinic where we have access to even in downtown and and it began make it made started making me think of, well, you know, we can't all, you know, we wonder, well, how can I return land? Well, maybe it's maybe a it's as because even Frida was said to me, it's not going back. It's how do we go forward? And going forward is how can we um, how can we help in a sense? And that would be the part of the healing. But how can we help provide what is really needed by by a community? So anyways, um, so that has got me thinking quite a bit. And I, mm. uh, and I have actually made an initial inquiry about it just to see what we could do. But, uh, but I think, that's, I think that's, um, that's where I see, you know, I agree. It, we, we could almost see this as 
being overwhelming. But I was mm -hmm. really struck when Frida said that to me because I thought, no, that that's a way we can move forward. Mm -hmm. Take that first oh. step. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really want to thank you. I don't know, Rachel, if you're going to ask another question, but I want to thank you. No, I, would, I was just going to express my gratitude. And mm -hmm. and um, I love I love the focus that all of you brought on on um, have. I don't know if you can see here. The West Wing is a is a favorite of mine, but ah, what's next? Right. And I really, really appreciated the focus on what's next. Um, one step, one conversation, um, and keep moving forward. And I don't know what you think, Bishop Didi, but for our first podcast guests, I think these bishops have set the bar pretty high. This has been a great I'm conversation. Really <laughs> well, and I'm very grateful again for y'all being here and for this conversation. Yes. For those who are listening, um, I encourage you to learn more, to speak more, and to take your voice and share your knowledge and wisdom with this world and to take that next brave step to do something that mean, has meaning and deep value for someone else and builds reconciliation and love in this world. May you be blessed and know that you are loved and be a blessing. And we'll, we'll hear you soon. Take good care.